yeah first of all thank you everyone for joining back i hope you all had a great lunch so now as we had a great lunch now it's time for a, another interesting topics so now our next topic in line is getting started with xr automation and that will be delivered by alisha rajada and rishika gupta i'll quickly introduce both of our speaker as well as little bit about the topic what they are going to showcase to us today so what arishika gupta is quality analyst graduate consultant with testing experience of about 2 years she has worked with various tools frameworks for example like you can take buff suit in interceptor postman unity and usual rest assured and selenium she has very basic understanding of the unreal engine she is passionate about trying out new tools and picking up new skills she really enjoys this and see views difficulties as an opportunity to grow so that's all about the rishika gupta now i'll quickly introduce our next co speaker alisha raijada she is also currently working as a quality analyst graduate consultant and exploring 3d automation of xr apps she is an interestious passionate and optimistic individual who believes little challenges lead to great results she has taken keen interest in ui automation xr automation and all other test uh, related activities like test planning test design test execution she is incredibly passionate towards learning cutting edge technologies to meet new business challenges recently she started writing technical blogs also on these topics she believes quality assurance is not in finding defects it's about developing a quality mindset and maintaining product quality right from the inception so that's all about alisha and now the topic is like as i said getting started with xr automation it's very interesting so one brief about the topic is like they will be discussing the mind shift change which is required when we will move to xr testing so in order to make wise strategic decision on implementation xr technologies like augmented reality virtual reality uh, which are becoming more prevalent on shop floors nowadays they will talk about the various xr testing tools which are available in market and on top of that they will discuss about our thoughtox own tool which is arium and provide details on how testing is carried out using it they will demonstrate xr automation using arium for all of us and they will also share their so far xr automation journey which will cover their experiences challenges and breakthroughs on closing that and i'll hand it hand it over to alicia and jessica for their topic uh thanks jayan such for such warm introduction i'll share my screen uh is it visible yes yes sir. vacancy okay so hi everyone uh, this is alisha rai zada and today i along with rishika gupta am here to present on getting started with xr automation so before we start let me share with you the agenda of our talk so initially we'll be talking about the emerging technologies like extended reali reality uh, augmented reality virtual reality and mixed reality and for xr automation there's a certain mind shift that is required so we'll next we'll talk about mind shift required for xr automation also we'll discuss about the tools and tech stack that are required for developing uh, xr applications as well as testing them also we'll look into one of the thoughtworks own tool that is arium which is used for xr automation practically also we'll see like how arium works through our demo and lastly we'll end up our talk by sharing our xr automation uh, journey and the challenges we faced till date so let's uh, come lo let's talk about the emerging technologies so we often hear terms like extended reality virtual reality augmented reality mixed rea uh, mixed reality and all this right so what do you think is the point of commonality between all these terms that is reality right so now the question arises what is reality so let's try and understand reality first so is it something you know which can be which which is physically seen which we can physically see or we, which we can touch or sense or is it or is it something beyond that so to answer this question 
uh, I have a small exercise for all of you. So you can see uh, an image shown over here. It is a shoe, right? So I just want to know from you people, like uh, what is the color of the shoe? Is it pink or white or is it gray or green? You can post your answers in the chat. Folks, let's be interactive, please. And green. It's for me, it's pink and white. For uh, folks in Bangalore, it's gray. Okay. Green it's green. gray and green. Like for me, it's pink and white. Anybody else who can see it as pink and white? For Chennai, it's pink and white. <laughs> okay. So now you must be uh, like wondering how is it pink and white for some and how is it gray and green for others, right? So this is what reality is. We can interpret from here that to some extent, the way we process information and the way we construct reality, it is unique to each one of us, okay? It depends on our genetics, it depends on our previous experiences, and it depends on the way we perceive the world, okay? So what we can say is reality is a construct that each one of us makes based on what we perceive from our senses. So now that, uh, now that we have understood what reality is, we can talk about emerging technologies. So you can see a diagram given over here, okay? So what you can interpret from this diagram is, like XR is something which is actually an umbrella term and it is covering all these three technologies, VR, MR, and AR, right? And MR is something which is a combination of both, that is VR and AR, right? So let's deep dive into each of these topics one by one. So let's talk about virtual reality. Now, what is the literal meaning of virtual? Okay, it is something that is imaginary, right? And reality is something that we have uh, like just got to know what exactly it means, right? It depends, uh, it is a construct which we perceive from our senses, right? So don't you think it, it is actually bringing a kind of contradiction like both these terms are actually very different from each other, right? So when we talk about virtual reality, it is more of a simulated experience, okay? It is quite far from the physical world. We are having few of the VR devices. When we wear a device, okay, we, we get to see an altogether, you know, uh, uh, we, we just actually get to see an altogether different scene in front of us okay, which is actually fully immersive and which is actually fully digital kind of environment, okay? And when you remove that particular device, all the experience will be gone. So we have certain VR devices, like we have HTC Vive, we have a Google Cardboard, we have Oculus Rift and all these. So this is what virtual reality means. Now let's talk about augmented reality, okay? So what augmented means, the literal meaning of augmented is to place something at one particular place. So uh, basically, uh, when we talk about augmented reality, it is actually, you can say, a, a quite close to physical world, okay? Or you can say it is a view of physical world with an overlay of digital elements, right? So uh, we all use Flipkart, right? So suppose if we have to buy some furniture, what we do is, we simply scan through the place uh, where we have to place that, uh, that very furniture and we get to see like how exactly it will look, right? When that, that furniture is placed over there, right? Similarly, like we all use Snapchat, right? So there are, there are several filters. It scans through your face and you, know, you get to see uh, like how that filter is applied on your face. Similarly, like might be some of you must have used the Pokemon Go game. So what, like, uh, what exactly happens is in this game is uh, it scans through the place, like you can scan any place and uh, you can see that uh, creatures, you know, they are placed on that very place. So such kind of uh, like exposure you get in augmented reality. So now that we have understood what virtual reality is, what augmented reality is, we can talk about mixed reality, okay? So mixed reality is a combination of both. It is a combination of virtual reality and augmented reality, as I already uh, addressed earlier, okay? 
so you can say that it is a view of physical world with an overlay of digital elements now the thing is here physical and digital elements they are able to interact with each other just for example suppose you are wearing a vr device okay now a, a complete different scene comes in front of you fully digital scene appears in front of you now in that very scene suppose if we place few of the digital elements also what will happen like you are and and what if like if we may if you are able to interact with those digital elements so that will be called as mixed reality okay so now uh, we can say that extended reality is something which is which is actually an umbrella term and that encompasses all these three terminologies like uh, this virtual reality augmented reality and mixed reality so now let's talk about mind shift that is required for xr automation handing over to rishika thank you alisha so in this section we are going to discuss what uh, mindset changes do we require when we are uh, doing the xr automation so whenever we think of testing tools in general what is the first tool that comes to your mind i think of selenium then comes cypress playwright uh, apm and what not but in any case can we consider these tools for testing xr applications the answer is no so for accessing any element in selenium we require locators uh, locators can be id name xpath link text etc but imagine you are having an application where you are wear some glasses and you experience as if you are in a forest you can feel the breeze blowing you can hear the birds chirping you can feel that you are touching the trees in any case we can't test these functionalities using selenium we won't have xpath to reach any particular tree uh, we don't have any way to test whether we are able to listen to the birds chirping we won't have a way to test if we can feel the breeze or not so eventually we need to change our mindset while we are testing any any of the xr applications so uh, now i will be mentioning the list of scenarios that we should keep in mind uh, for testing xr applications so one point that we have to consider is that the how we should consider while testing that how the physical environment will affect the virtual environment uh, let me give an example for example you are wearing some sort of glasses and then you experience as if in you are you are in a museum so you might be standing in a small room you might be standing in a huge room you might be standing on your terrace you might be standing on your ground so you should test that whether your uh, virtual environment is fully is completely shown is completely and nicely visible in every any of the physical environment that you are standing in another point of consideration is that you should try to validate each and every flow so in other any other type of testing uh, in any other simple browser testing we don't have large number of flows but in xr applications we can have a many number of flows for example uh, if i want to if i have a museum and i want to go from one room to another room and if there are more than five rooms in the uh, in the museum you might be having many ways to move from one room to another room so we should create our test in such a way that the uh, most of the many of the like maximum number of the flows are validated with minimum number of tests next and very important thing is that if we are giving any variables to the user we should test whether those variables uh, variables are uh, comfortable or not like if we are giving some gloves to the user we are giving some extra glasses we should test whether they are comfortable or not also one more important point is that when we are working in xr automation it is a huge probability that we are working with 3d objects so it is very uh, it is like uh, beneficial for the testers to understand 3d max because for testing uh, whether the objects are placed and uh, sized correctly we need to understand the 3d max so by 3d max i mean how uh, how are we going to calculate the distance between two uh, objects what is the surface area of the objects and all that stuff good question also... so i was wondering uh... so here the user wears a physical headset how do you simulate that in automation testing yeah actually we have some tools regarding that uh, we'll be mentioning those tools in our further slides so uh, uh, actually we have some one tool called automated tester so with that tool we can simulate all that stuff using uh, 
uh, like we can uh, simulate and uh, we can test our XR applications with that tool. So the, the person who is conducting the testing does not need to wear the headset, right? No, he has to wear the headset. Only then he will be able, if the person who is conducting the uh, headset, uh, conducting the experiments, uh, because the user, the end user will be wearing the headsets or uh, uh, whatever, uh, like whatever wearable he is wearing. So if the tester is testing that, he should also wear those uh, things. There's no concept of headless, like, uh, to use the web app analogy. You can have headless Chrome. There is no headless. Uh, as of now, uh, there isn't. But maybe in future, near future, there may be. Uh, is your question clear? May I continue, please? Yeah, yeah. Please. Thank you. OK. So uh, I left on that we should understand the 3D maths uh, for the testers. Next, we should also understand the positioning of the lightning and camera. So uh, it has a major effect on how the objects will be visualized. So as a tester, we should understand how, whether the objects are getting visualized correctly from all the directions. So we should understand how to move the cameras here and there. Uh, I hope this is clear now. So now we'll be moving to tools and tech stack. So this section is divided into two parts. Uh, the first section will be de determining what are the tools and tech stacks that we require for development. And in next section, we will be understanding what, the, what are the tools and tech stacks that are required for testing. So uh, let's understand about development tool, uh, tools. So first, uh, we are going to discuss about Babylon.js. So it is a simple web rendering engine. Uh, it is very powerful. It is backwards compatible. This means that uh, if you're working on any uh, Babylon, uh, if you're working on Babylon 5.0 and we have written a piece of code, that can work easily on Babylon 4.02. Also, it is completely open source and it is written in TypeScript. But uh, there is one disadvantage of using Babylon.js that it's, it works only with web standards. Next, we will be discussing about 3.js. So 3.js is also a JavaScript library, and it is used to uh, display animated computer graphics on web browser. Uh, it runs on all the browsers that are supported by WebGL. Uh, WebGL stands for Web Graphics Library. And uh, these, these uh, 3.js scripts can be used in conjunction with uh, the HTML5 canvas elements. But there is one downside, and th there are many downsides of working with 3.js. Uh, 3.js. One is that for simple functionality, also we'll have to write a large amount of code. And uh, also like we cannot use trackpad for controlling the camera. Like for example, if I, uh, if I want that, if I move my cursor over here, the camera should also move over there. And if I move my cursor over there, the camera should also move over there. So this thing uh, is not possible in 3.js. Next, we're going to discuss about build box. So Buildbox is a tool that can be used to uh, create games, uh, drag and drop games, and uh, many types of uh, uh, like many types of games can be uh, created using Buildbox, like endless runners, level based games, and whatnot. But uh, like uh, there is no uh, technical skills required or no scripting knowledge required when we are creating uh, uh, games using Buildbox uh, because, as I told you, it is a drag and drop tool only. But as but uh, this also creates a drawback for this build box because if everything is drag and drop, there is no not much customization possible, and creating virtual reality applications is actually completely not possible in build box. Next, we are going to discuss about Unity. So it is the most important tool that we are going to discuss over here. So it is a cross-platform game engine. We can easily integrate it with uh, Agora engine for adding like for new advanced functionalities. And uh, it has very large community base. And in, in this, implementing uh, spatial audio is possible. So what spatial audio is, like for example, you, you have a speaker and you have attached an audio component to that speaker. So when I move far away from that speaker, I'll uh, listen to a very soft sound. And if I go close to that speaker, I'll wear a loud, I'll, I'll hear a very loud, loud sound. So that uh, thing is possible in Unity. But the license cost in Unity is very much high. Like it is $185 plus taxes. And the 
graphics in Unity are not very, very high quality ones. Next, let's move on to Unreal Engine. So Unreal Engine enables the developers to, uh, to uh, view how to create the real time 3D content and the performance in uh, uh, Unreal Engine is very nice. And also the graphics uh, uh, in Unreal Engine are also very nice. It uses C++, but uh, we it is not preferable for small games because the game that is built contains a lot of data. And even if the game, uh, even if the game has only one scene and a few scripts, uh, the game, the small game would take more space than they should. So uh, this is why it is not advisable to make, uh, to create small games in Unreal, Unreal Engine. So now we will be discussing about the testing tech stack. So let's take our discussion uh, from Unreal Engine only. Let's start our discussion from Unreal Engine only. So in Unreal Engine, we can run uh, unit test cases, uh, functional test cases, and uh, any of the test cases. Uh, we just need to add gauntlet and functional testing, uh, uh, gauntlet and functional testing uh, plugin as it is visible in the screenshot itself. And also, we also have screenshot comparing feature in uh, Unreal Engine. So if I talk in a nutshell, testing and automation, like any type of testing, automation testing is also very, very straightforward in Unreal Engine. Next, let's uh, let's discuss about ordinary tester. Uh, as someone just asked us about this, so uh, this is the tool that we can use for uh, uh, running our tests on real devices. It is a test automation tool, and in this, the tests can be written in C sharp, Python, or Java. And also, we can find uh, the objects in a scene using uh, using the ordinary inspector. But there is one drawback of like there are the, one drawback of it is. The integration of a uh, Unity tester is a bit complex, and uh, running the test cases in Unity editor, like uh, uh, if you're working working with Unity, uh, the then running the test cases in Unity editor is sometimes uh, very tough. So next tool we are going to discuss is Arium. So Arium is very lightweight uh, automation testing framework, and it is ThoughtWorks proprietary tool. So I want to ask Alicia to tell us more about Arium. Thank you. So let's discuss about Arium now. So Arium is a testing framework for Unity applications. It is used for testing Unity applications because it is built on top of Unity. It is lightweight, it is extensible, extensible as in more and more features could be added to it. It is platform agnostic. Platform agnostic means uh, like uh, it, it can work on any, uh, it can run on any combination of uh, operating system and underlying preprocessor architecture. And uh, we can run functional tests on 3D applications and almost all the platforms are supported. Like few of them are mentioned over here. We can run our tests in Unity Editor, Android and Windows. So let's understand about Arium framework in detail. So we have a class that is Arium and inside that we have game object cache and we have certain functions which it provides. So, uh, just uh, like to start with Arium, first of all, we need to instantiate the Arium object. Now, talking about this game object cache, so basically it is used to, you know, it is used to easily access the game object, easy and fast access to game objects. Also, we have operations like uh, perform action, we have find game object function, and we have get component. So now just to mention, like while automating uh, web applications, we have certain locators to identify the UI elements, right? In gaming world, we don't have elements. We have game objects. So to get hold of a particular game object, we have this find game object function. Now, uh, in this find game object function, we need to give the unique name of the game object. And if the name of the game object is not unique, then we need to explicitly give the complete path of the game object so as to get hold of the game object. Now that we have got, uh, like we have found the game object, the next step is to identify the components attached to it, to get hold of the components attached to it. So let me give you an example. Suppose we have an input field, okay? So maybe that, 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 that can be a game object for us. And the components attached to it can be, suppose uh, there's a text, text written in that, so text component is attached to very game object. 
So that will be a component of it. So we can fetch that very component using this get component method of that respective game object. So these are for this is for finding the game object and this is for getting hold of the component of the game object. Then we have the perform action. Now this perform action function, what basically it does is it, it allows us to perform certain operations on a game object. So in background, what, 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 what like how is it implemented is like uh, it is using some interface. It, it, is, it implements some interface in background, okay? So in perform action, we need to give the interaction first, like which which thing we want, which action we want want to perform on a on a respective game object, and then we need to explicitly mention on which game object that action needs to be performed. So like with every interaction, uh, we have two so two sets of actions. One is the set action thing, and one is the perform action thing. So action is performed at runtime. So we have various interactions that we will see, like you can uh, see some of them are mentioned over here. We have unity pointer click, we have unity pointer enter, we have unity pointer exit, and we have some other event systems as well. So let's look into a few of the interactions which are provided in Arium. So we have animator, like uh, just to give you an example, suppose if you are having some game object whose color is changing, right? So with the help of this animator, we can actually uh, uh, like identify that thing. Similarly, we have this drag handler. Now drag handler, what, is, what it does is, it is used for transforming the position of game object from one, like, from one position to other. Similarly, we have pointer click handler. So click uh, is basically, uh, it basically uh, implements using I pointer click handler interface. It is for the click operation. Similarly, we have en uh, enter and exit handler, pointer enter handler and pointer exit handler. It is for focus in and focus out purpose. Then we have this rigid body. So rigid body basically provides. So uh, just to give you an example, suppose uh, we we uh, like uh, we want gravity over some game object. We don't want uh, our game object to move uh, to have any motion in z direction. So for that sake, what we will do is. We, we will go to this rigid body component and we can en enable gravity over there. We can check in gravity. And same, same thing, we can uh, also test using this rigid body component, which is provided in Arium. So now, uh, what, whatever we saw uh, in Arium, we can uh, also uh, just see that uh, all those things practically in our demo video. Uh, handing over to Rishika. Thanks, Alicia. So now we will be discussing, we'll be seeing how Arium works, actually works in action. So before moving directly uh, to Arium, let's understand the UI of Unity first. So over here in Unity, we have uh, this hierarchy window on the left-hand side, where we can see what is the, uh, on the top, we can see what is the scene name. So whatever we see uh, at, in our camera at the first, in our first view is a scene. So right now we just have one scene in our uh, application. This is the main scene. So you can see whenever I click on any of the thing, uh, that thing gets selected on the scene view and you can see uh, the uh, details or components related to that in the inspector window. In the same way, whenever I click on any of the object in uh, uh, scene view, we can see that that object is, that particular object is select, selected in the hierarchy window. And you can see some more related information to that in the inspector window. So uh, right as of now, just get, keep this, uh, pay a little more attention to this transform component and the position property of this. So this position property tells what is the exact position, like what is the exact position of the component that we have just selected. Also take a little attention to this component. This is a ground uh, component. This is a, uh, and we have to just, uh, and this collectible component. So these small uh, components are collectibles. On the bottom, bottom over here, we have this uh, project window where we can see what are the assets, uh, like whatever the things that are required for the project are in this assets window. And over here, you can see we have this Arium framework also inside the assets folder. So Arium is integrated with uh, assets. Also where here, we have a console window where if there are any errors or warnings, we can they can be visible over here. So let us just go to the 
code and understand how things work. So uh, first of all, we have created one time setup and uh, one time setup means this piece of code will be executed just once before both the tests. Uh, first, let me just explain you the game view also. So this is the game view. Uh, this shows how the game will look in the uh, through the camera. I'll just play this game. This is the play button. We can use this button to play. So the first test is uh, it should move to next position. So if on the ground I click on this position, I should be able to move to this position. The player should be able to move to this position. So let us try it. Yes, so this is our first test. Next test is whenever I click on any of the crystals, uh, I should be able to destroy this crystal. So whenever I click on this, the crystal is destroyed. So these are the two, uh, uh, two tests that we are going to validate in our test. So in one time setup, this piece of code, as I told you, will be executed once before both these tests. So here we are creating an ARIAM object and we are loading the main scene. As I have shown you that this whole scene is a main scene. Now the first test that we are uh, that we are creating is should move to position. So uh, this position for for this we have created on one variable called position, and in that position we have placed the uh, we have placed the coordinates of where I want my uh, want my player to move to. So uh, in this, we have uh, written uh, 3, 0 0.1, 6. So I want my position of uh, the player to be this position. Next, what we are doing is we are creating an event data of uh, um, event data and we are uh, bundling this uh, position into an event data. Why we are doing this, we'll understand this when we go to the this perform action uh, option. So here we have just bundled the uh, position into the event data. Now we are doing it because in unity pointer click, we have uh, one argument that is event data. So over here, what is happening is that we are performing the action of unity pointer click on the game object ground at this particular position that is bundled in the event data that is specified over here. I'll just repeat myself once again. So over here, what we are doing, we are performing the action of unity pointer click at the position that is mentioned in this event data and on this ground game object, the ground object that I asked you to uh, pay more attention to. So on this ground object, we are going to uh, click on this particular uh, position. Then as you might have seen that it takes time to move from one position to other position. So we have added one weight. And next, what we are doing is we are calculating the distance between the position, what we have mentioned over here, and the current position of the player. So you might be wondering that now, as of now, since the player has moved to this new location, why are we measuring the distance between these two things? So actually the thing is, everything is not uh, like 100% accurate over here. So might be there is some difference somewhere and there over the here, here and there. So in the next line, so we are calculating the distance between these two positions. And then we are asserting that this should distance should be less than 0 0.02 f. So this is how we test uh, uh, that whether a, an, uh, a player is able to move to other position or not. Next, what we are doing is we are creating a test that uh, tells should destroy collectible on collection. So here, what we have done is we have created, a, like we have added this collectible to the collectible uh, string. And then we have got, uh, we have done get component, like we are getting the comp transform component of player and we are getting the transform comp component of collectible. So why we are doing this is that because in the collectible uh, in the transform component we have this position property. So if I want to know the position, uh, if I want to know the position of any of the thing, I'll get the component. Uh, uh, I'll get the transform component and then I'll access the uh, access the position property using dot position. So that's what we have done in this sixty uh, fourth line of uh, uh, line of code. So we have done that uh, uh, player dot position. So what we are doing over here is we are lurping. So lurping here means find. Uh, we are jumping. So what we are doing is we are finding what is the pos current position of the player, what is the position of the collectible, and then since here it is written zero point five f, then uh, we are calculating the coordinates that are exactly in middle of the distance, and then we are placing those coordinates in the position. Why we are doing this? 
so that uh, I get a clearer view of the collectible. Then what we are doing is, as in the previous test, we are bundling that, uh, we are bundling or wrapping that position that we have just got, and uh, we are wrapping that position into uh, uh, an event data, and we are performing the action and clicking on that ground. So what we are doing is, we are performing the action of unity pointer click on the position that we have mentioned over here. So after this step, after waiting for four seconds, what happens is that we are uh, finally, uh, we are very like at, uh, at a close distance from the collectible or the crystal that we just saw. And then we are wait, uh, and then uh, uh, we are waiting for four seconds and we're directly looking at the collectible transform. And then what we are doing is we are just performing the click operation on collectible and waiting for four seconds. At uh, the last line of the code, what we are doing is we are uh, checking that see now at this point of time, the collectible will be destroyed. So this what this piece of uh, code is doing is that it is finding the game object collectible and show and ask that and asserting that this this piece of code should throw game object not found exception. So this is how uh, we are going to test this. And we have this assembly.asmdf file where we have made it all the references and all the pre-compiled references over here. Now let us move to our test and uh, to our unit and test, uh, test whether these tests are working fine or not. So I'll go to window. Then I'll go to general, test runner, play mode, and run on. We move close to the collectible. And now we are clicking on, click, we are clicking on it and that has disappeared. And the assertion has passed. And we also move to new position. So that's how we run test cases in uh, Arium. Over to you, Alicia. Uh, so now I will share our XR automation journey till now. So initially when we got the opportunity to work on XR automation, uh, we had no clue where to start from and what to do, nothing at all. So we had no idea. At the same time, like we had the feeling that uh, this would actually open doors for a lot of exploration and a lot of learning as well. So we started with understanding the project requirements first. Uh, yeah. So we started with understanding the project requirements first. We started off with uh, exploratory testing. And side by side, we learned the tech stack of project that is Unity and C-sharp. Now, when we have understood uh, the basics of Unity and C-sharp, uh, we tried to find the automation tools. We were having two options then. So one was Alt Unity Tester, which is used when there's a, there's a direct connection. And the other one was Arium which comes with less features as of now, but it, it was more suitable for desktop applications. So we moved ahead with Arium. We integrated Arium with our project, which is actually easy. Next, we tried understanding the development code. Now, one thing I would like to uh, mention here is that uh, while you are testing any XR application, it is very much important to understand the development Im implementations very properly because uh, then only you could come up with an approach for the automation testing. Uh, next, to understand the ARIUM better, we started off with the basic test cases first, got a gist of ARIUM, and then we prepared a strategy for complex test cases. Then we started writing uh, automation test cases. Uh, so initially, uh, we faced issues with things like finding a game object or even like uh, clicking on a game object or maybe fetching text from a game object. But later, these uh, things became simpler. And like I would just say that every day is a challenge in itself. But in process, there's, there's a lot of learning as well. And when you finally make it happen, that actually brings true happiness. So let me talk about challenges now. So uh, as it is mentioned that in Arium, we don't have any uh, functionality to simulate keyboard events. Yes, so we are working on that part. And uh, we don't have enough reporting tools. So what you saw is like uh, there we had a window in background. It is using test runner. So there we had a window of test runner. And in that, you can see all the test cases were getting displayed. 
and logs are also generated. So that kind of uh, thing we are having right now in Arium. Uh, and uh, many testing libraries are not supported in Mac. Yes, because uh, like I was just I was I, I would just give you an example. Like we had to take like for one particular test, we had to take screenshot of entire screen. So for that sake, uh, like uh, we researched a bit and we came across uh, like certain libraries. One of them I remember was Pranas library, but it was compatible with Windows. And actually most of them were compatible with Windows only, Windows system only. So many testing libraries are not supported in Mac. So that, that again is a challenge. So we had to think out of box on that part. So it got implemented. And uh, uh, we need to have understanding of development code. So yes, that is a must that I already addressed. And we don't have enough resources and community support for the same. So all we can do is we, we can explore on our part and implement. And things like audio sharing, spatial audio, camera movements, and uh, maybe avatar movements and all that. So that is again a challenge to test. So it totally depends on your, uh, like how it is developed and how it is implemented. Then you can plan a, plan in a strategy for automating it. So here we have attached few of the references, which you can refer to, uh, which will give you a better idea on 3D automation using Arium. Um, that's all from our end. And over to you for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Alicia, for the wonderful session. So the floor is open for Q&A. Bangalore, Chennai, Gurgaon, or anyone from the remote, you can post it in Q&A or chat. No. I have one question. So you mentioned the area, like wait for a second. So it is for a wait time like that? Just like we have a uh, thread dot sleep. No, it's, it's similar to that. We are waiting like for a few seconds for that very game object to load. And then okay. we are moving to next step. Yes. And it can be used for uh, video game validation also. Uh, I think yes. Yes. A question from Bangalore. So I just want to know simulation is possible, can be simulated device and we can execute the test case. Uh, can you come again? I did not get you. Simulate. So without device can we test something? Simulate. Yes, without device also we can uh, test some, like some scenarios uh, are there, no? Like uh, you, you are able to see like most of the, like some devices, uh, sorry, okay. I'll repeat. Some projects could be like uh, just AR based. Right. So for that, you don't need any device. Yeah, I think we are done. So Kinnery, maybe if you can launch the feedback for them. Thanks, Alicia. Thanks, Rishika. It was a great talk. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.